Alrighty, let's get back at it. So we finished PowerPoint number one. We are now starting Forensic DNA, PowerPoint number two. So this is the PowerPoint where I'm gonna talk um, about different types of DNA analysis. Remember, the, the one that's the most common is DNA from the nucleus called nuclear DNA and the type of method is STRs. So when we think about different types of samples, so, you know, if you go to give blood, let's say your doctor wants to check, you know, something in your blood, maybe you're anemic, um, that's pretty easy, right? You know, it's pretty easy to get DNA from blood. But in forensic science, remember, um, you know, who knows what our sample is gonna be. So it's important that we're able to extract DNA um, from a lot of different types of body fluids and samples. Um, and it kind of goes with, you know, remember anything that potentially comes out of a human body um, is going to have DNA on it. I would also mention for my vet forensic students, um, anything out of an animal's body, you know, so all of these types of fluids apply to animals as well. So yeah, I mean the top three body fluids would be blood, semen, and saliva, but sometimes, you know, weird things like earwax or, you know, boogers, um, perspiration, um, swabbing the backside of someone's contact lenses. Um, you know, as DNA has improved, the amount of sample that you need to get a full DNA profile has gotten a lot less. It's gotten very, very sensitive. So back in the old days, when I started out in DNA, um, you know, in the mid 90s, we were using an older technique and we had to um, have a lot of DNA to do that. And we, so we couldn't look really at saliva cases or perspiration cases or urine or some of these other types of tissues and body fluids. But with STRs, um, the sensitivity is much, much, much increased. Now there's um, types of DNA testing called contact DNA, trace DNA um, that are even more sensitive and actually Mm, I think they're kind of, in my opinion, kind of a double-edged sword because sometimes the sensitivity has gotten so high that theoretically, in my humble opinion, you can pick up DNA profiles that actually have nothing to do with, with the case. And that's, you know, what is a little bit scary to me. So when we are extracting DNA from evidence samples, and I gotta say, I'm bummed that we're not meeting face to face because I was actually gonna have you guys do a DNA extraction in class because it's super easy. Um, you just need a couple of chemicals. Okay, so, you know, when you hear about forensic scientists, you know, DNA analysts doing DNA extraction, um, it's not that hard. Let me tell you, if you guys can make Kraft macaroni and cheese, and I'm betting all of you can, you too can extract DNA, okay? It is not hard to do. It's a little, I mean, it's challenging with certain types of samples like teeth and bones, um, but when you have a sample like blood or saliva, it's actually quite easy. So we divide DNA extractions into two main case types, um, semen and non-semen. So when we're talking about non-semen samples, right, it's basically everything but semen. So blood, saliva, urine, um, perspiration, meaning that there are some cells that are gonna be shed in the perspiration. Um, you know, feces, vomit, you know, anything that's not semen related, we're gonna use a traditional DNA extraction. When we're dealing with sexual assault cases where semen is present, then we use a different type of extraction called a differential extraction. And what this does is it exploits the structure of actual sperm cells. And so it allows the analyst to separate male DNA from female DNA. Okay, And that can be really useful when you're trying to interpret a sexual assault case. If there is a swab taken from a victim's body, of course, that victim's profile is going to be there. Um, 
in every lining of our body and also the outside um, of our skin, um, we have you know tons and tons and tons of either dead skin cells you know on the outside or any type of orifice we have lots of what are known as epithelial cells which are just cells that line our mucous membranes so that's why we're able to get a dna sample from someone by doing just a cheek swab because you're going to pick up a lot of those um, epithelial cells so um, if it's urine coming out of the urethra you're going to get the dna from the epithelial cells if you swab um, a victim, uh, a sexual assault um, victim's vagina or rectum, you're gonna pick up a lot of the victim's epithelial cells. And so it's kind of a given that their profile is gonna be there. And what differential extraction does is it allows us to separate male from female. But I also wanna caution, it's when sperm is present, okay? You can have, um, you know, if, if perhaps ejaculation doesn't occur, maybe it's a pre-ejaculatory fluid, so there's no sperm, um, then you're not gonna have sperm cells, and so this won't work. Um, keep in mind, and you know, I say this to future police officers or investigators, remember, if semen isn't present, it doesn't necessarily mean that the crime does not have a sexual component, because as we talked about in the serial murders lecture, um, these are not normal men, okay? So they may not be able to function sexually um, and ejaculation may not occur. So, um, or they may be smart enough to use a condom and take it with them. So remember, not identifying semen doesn't necessarily exclude the fact that there was a sexual component. So, you know, just keep that in mind, future investigators. So here is how we isolate DNA. And it's literally the same process as when you do laundry. Okay, so we're gonna take whatever the original sample is, whether it's a blood stain, um, a saliva stain, you know, perspiration, maybe we're gonna extract the, you know, the collar of someone's shirt or the armpits of someone's shirt. Um, it's a tissue sample, maybe from a deceased victim. Also, I wanna point this out. Okay, when DNA, nuclear DNA testing is done on hair, it has to be hair that is forcibly pulled um, from someone's head or body because what you're actually doing the DNA on is um, the little skin tag that is at the, the base of the hair. So you're not doing it on the actual hair itself. That's a different type of testing called mitochondrial DNA, which we'll get to. Okay, so you're basically taking whatever you want to extract, you put it in a little um, test tube, add some chemicals, and voila, um, after a couple of steps and some incubation, um, you can extract DNA. So this is kind of the, you know, the, the detailed, um, you know, version of differential extraction. So sperm cells, which are shown here, okay? So let's say that we're looking at a sexual assault case and the victim states that ejaculation occurred in um, her vagina. So when swabs are taken, um, you know, during the collection of the sexual assault kit, those swabs are gonna pick up not only the sperm cells that are there, but also the victim's epithelial cells um, from the lining of the vagina. So you've got a mixture here. You've got victim and then you've got sperm from the offender. So the first step here, and it's basically just one extra step, um, you're gonna incubate that with, you know, what is basically detergent. Okay, and then you're gonna put it in a machine called a centrifuge, which you guys may have used, you know, back in the day in your basic biology classes. Um, it's just a machine that spins uh, things at a really high, um, you know, rate of speed. And so um, things that are solid will settle to the bottom. Um, you know, if you've gone on that ride at the fair, um, you know, where it, you know, I can't remember what it's called, but it spins you around really fast, you're basically in a centrifuge. That's what it does. Okay, so after we spin the tube in the centrifuge, what happens 
is sperm cells, which have a really tough outer coat and therefore are not burst open by the detergent solution that we added. And don't memorize these chemicals. I'm not gonna ask you what they do. But the sperm cells are still intact because they have such a hard outer coating. And so they are gonna settle at the bottom and you're gonna, uh, in a little, you know, it's gonna look like a little white, um, you know, kind of pellet at the bottom of the test tube. That's the sperm cells. Um, the other cells from the victim's epithelial cells have been burst open by the detergent. And so now their DNA um, or the victim's DNA is in the liquid portion. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna put it in a separate tube. That is going to be the victim fraction, okay? If it's a female victim, we call it the female fraction or shorthand, a lot of times we call it F1 for fraction one. Then we take that sperm pellet and we add more abrasive chemicals um, that will actually eat through the hard outer coating of the sperm cells and cause the DNA from the sperm to then be released and go into solution. And so now we have what we call F2 for fraction two or the male fraction. So the female DNA is in one test tube, the male DNA is in another test tube and that came from sperm cells. Um, so that's what we term a differential extraction. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there because I'm at 11 minutes. Um, so we will pick up here next video. Thank you.